In this quick overview video, we will evaluate different compression algorithms and assess how you can choose the right compression algorithm for your big data project. In terms of the agenda, we'll specifically take a look at uh, why we need to consider different algorithms to begin with. We'll then take a look at uh, some key observations across different uh, compression algorithms. And then finally, we'll try and narrow down the various compression algorithms based on our big data environment. And um, finally, we'll wrap it up with taking a look at some guidelines and recommendations and some specific uh, settings and examples. So to kick off, uh, again, chances are if you are doing some big data project at at some point in time, you're going to evaluate different compression algorithms. It might be compression algorithms like gzip versus snappy versus lzo versus various others. And obviously, uh, we need to factor in your big data environment. So first off, let's uh, understand why. Why do we need to factor in these uh, different compression algorithms? Well, it's a well-known fact that compression can help with the increase of performance, particularly when we are working with very I.O. intensive applications. Um, the reason is really straightforward. Uh, it's really about um, the, uh, the evaluation or the, uh, the, the simple fact that disks and general I.O. operations are much slower than other resources like CPUs. And uh, compression essentially reduces the disk footprint of um, your data essentially leading to faster reads and write operations. But at the same time, uh, what you're giving up or trading off is uh, your CPU cycles. Uh, so essentially, it's a trade-off between um, choosing between I.O. performance and CPU. Uh, that's fundamentally how compressions um, really work behind the scene. Uh, but importantly, we need to address um, any particular performance and throughput requirements of the environment. Like say, for example, if you're working uh, on a real-time application, um, throughput and essentially SLAs of uh, your throughput would have a bearing in terms of choosing your compression algorithms, as well as um, your end users, how they're going to consume the data, uh, what tool sets they're going to use to analyze the data and performance or user experience in a nutshell and also pertaining to cost. So again, different compression algorithms use different resources like disk storage cost versus uh, CPU and computational cost, etc. So essentially, we need to consider these collectively uh, before making a decision. But uh, before we actually dive into uh, the specific recommendations, let's actually sidestep and take a look at uh, the behavior, if you will, of uh, various compression algorithms. Um, so let's uh, let me actually switch over to the next slide, and uh, just to give you an idea in terms of um, how we can evaluate different um, compression algorithms. Uh, while there are different ways that we could do that, broadly these are some of the parameters that you will keep in mind as you're assessing um, the various. Um, compression algorithm. So first off is this idea of um, the compression ratio. In a nutshell, that basically implies um, how, how much of um, data has been compressed or how good the actual compression itself is from the source to the destination. Uh, throughput, as I pointed out earlier, again, has a bearing in terms of the performance of uh, the compression typically measured in something like MBs per second, for example, megabits per second as a throughput uh, evaluation. Uh, obviously, related to throughput is this idea of how quickly uh, the algorithm can do compression. But um, often we forget about the fact that uh, we are not just talking about one-way compression. It has to decompress as well. And different algorithms have uh, different performance for compression as opposed to decompression. So typically, when we are looking at um, the point in time when we are analyzing the data, uh, so as an end user, uh, when they're accessing the data, it's typically the decompression speed that factors in or that matters as opposed to the compression speed itself. Um, and then finally, uh, let's not forget the fact that uh, when we are talking about resources, we have to consider even memory as well. Um, so um, again, I would say that um, memory is possibly not the, uh, not the most common thing that you would assess the algorithm against. But uh, again, when we are talking about throughput itself, um, there are parameters such as memory that factors in as well. Um, so uh, to help uh, assist in illustrating how different algorithms work, I've um, uh, 
uh, I found this uh, quite interesting article um, on the web and this is the source um, of um, that article it's quite comprehensive uh, however just pointing out that uh, the article itself is um, primarily focused around um, Java based benchmarking um, as opposed to a big data however given that much of our big data workload is built on top of Java we can actually extrapolate some of these numbers that you can see here but uh, instead of going into the nitty gritty details about every algorithm, just pointing out maybe two algorithms that kind of sets the scene for the rest of um, this overview. So let's take a look at gzip and snappy. Uh, so you'll notice that gzip and snappy have different performance characteristics as highlighted in the legend here So the yellow implies throughput um, the performance or uh, you know um, overall what's the kind of throughput that you get uh, basically uh, Higher numbers are better and uh, the second one is the compression um, In terms of the compression ratio that we talked about and lower would be better um, so here you'll notice that gzip here has a much better compression uh, capability than snappy that you can see here however snappy has a much higher throughput than gzip so again it just gives you an idea in terms of just two algorithms that we have seen so far and these are the two most commonly used uh, algorithms in big data projects so snappy again was uh, originally developed by google and made available um, as open source um, but you can see that uh, different algorithms tend to provide different performance characteristics so now that we've understood broadly um, you know some of the parameters that we need to keep in mind uh, when we look at these compression algorithms let's try and narrow it down uh, to some specific recommendations on your big data and projects so the first thing you'll want to keep in mind is uh, actually uh, the support across your entire big data real estate uh, within your organization so we are not necessarily talking about uh, one particular tool for example it could be your entire stack and in some cases you obviously have more than one big data environments like you might have multiple Hadoop clusters for example and if there's a need to keep it portable or move data between clusters you're talking about a holistic view across your entire big data real estate uh, so again, in general, uh, you have this idea that um, you have different backend systems. Uh, I mentioned Hadoop and um, very frequently in this overview, but also keeping in mind that Hadoop might not be the only system or HDFS uh, as the only system that stores the data. Your data could very well reside in other cloud storage systems like uh, uh, Amazon's S3. Or for that matter, when we are talking about big data and real-time systems, uh, we, we also frequently use um, solutions like Kafka uh, for real-time applications and enabling that real-time data pipelines. So again, across these systems, uh, you need to have a file format or a compression format that's supported across these systems. Uh, and obviously that's just uh, one layer of your platform. You obviously have other systems like uh, your data analyst, for example, or your ETL processes might be relying on Spark, Hive, uh, MPP engines like Impala or um, you know, SQL on Hadoop systems like Presto, for example. Uh, so you need to evaluate how these different encryption algorithms are supported by pretty much your entire stack. Um, and also importantly, um, how those uh, compression algorithm is supported by formats uh, like uh, Parquet uh, or ORC file formats. Um, so that's an important factor to keep in mind. Uh, but immediately outside of um, the technology stack itself, it's uh, important to assess how your data is going to be utilized. What's the lifetime of that data and how is it going to be utilized? So again, let's uh, take a look at two different scenarios. So uh, if we were to consider environments like uh, real-time data processing, in which case, uh, say again, you're storing the data inside of Kafka, but that, um, that data is uh, fairly temporary in the sense that that's not a permanent store for your data uh, so you might choose uh, something that's uh, got a higher throughput for example than better uh, optimizations in terms of disk uh, storage as opposed to say um, data and access patterns like if you have hot data versus cold data in some cases uh, you have data that has a very very long lifetime but it's not 
access that often, in which case you might opt for a format like gzip, for example, uh, as you may remember when we discussed different compression algorithms, gzip, um, you can use gzip to store cold data, but uh, for data that's more frequently accessed, you might choose a different uh, serialization like snappy. And then the last parameter that um, is pertinent to keep in mind is uh, in terms of the actual workload itself and how, how best different compression algorithms enable itself for uh, splittability, even if that's a, a word. But uh, obviously in context of our conversation, uh, if I use an example of gzip, uh, so gzip is an example of a format that's not um, uh, splittable. Uh, so essentially if you're running processes like MapReduce, which uh, is better geared towards uh, uh, formats that are splittable, then gzip might not necessarily be the best format. So again, these are broadly some of the parameters that uh, you can use to evaluate different compression algorithms. Uh, but then um, in what, what happens in the real world or in most common scenarios is you end up trying to choose between popular formats like gzip and snappy. Uh, again, there are lots of different formats, but if you look at um, some of these parameters, you end up having to support um, compression formats that are more widely supported and much more portable across your big data stack. And hence, it boils down to gzip versus snappy in vast majority of the cases. And again, it, it, these days, this uh, this cost is much less. Um, and um, you know, essentially, you try to focus in on uh, your overall performance of your big data stack. And hence, uh, snappy tends to be uh, overall a very good choice uh, across your big data real estate. And also, given the fact that uh, both snappy and gzip are also supported by um, uh, columnar file stores like Parquet and ORC. Uh, which brings up to the question of evaluating other uh, compression algorithms like uh, we saw um, earlier in the previous slide that you have other compression file formats um, that um, are, give you much better throughput and um, you know formats like LZ4 for example give you incredibly good both LZ and LZ4 give you really good decompression performance. But typically what happens is it's not installed as part of your typical Hadoop stack or it might not be installed um, as a default uh, within your Hadoop distribution. So in which case it's really important to uh, one, evaluate the license model for your compression algorithm of choice. And if it's not already installed, you can use your, your preferred distribution, uh, Hadoop distribution approach to installing that uh, within your cluster. So finally, having reviewed different compression algorithms, let's uh, move on to the last um, uh, topic in this uh, presentation is to take a look at some example settings. Uh, so while your big data stack um, might involve different components, uh, it'll, uh, it's not gonna be feasible in this video to go through configurations and settings for your entire stack. So I'm going to just focus on maybe two of the most commonly requested uh, for topics, which is on Spark and Hive. So across both uh, Spark and Hive, you can uh, specify what your compression algorithm is here. So uh, in this example, we are using Parquet um, as the columnar store format. And this is how you can specify Snappy uh, as the compression algorithms within Parquet. And in case of Hive, um, different ways that you could set the compression. Um, so if you're doing it as a one-off, uh, just before say, for example, you're running some um, data ingestion operations and or using ETL uh, within Hive, uh, you can just set uh, Parquet compression within that session. Or uh, in broadly more common cases is you might set it as one of the table properties. Um, so at the point of time when you're creating a table in Hive, you can specify what that compression format is, uh, whether you're using Parquet or if you're using ORC, you can set the compression to Snappy or GZIP for that matter. So that uh, wraps up for this video on how you can evaluate different compression algorithms uh, for your big data projects.